So I want to talk for a few minutes about um, what I think is really going on uh, behind the scenes. And what I really think, what I think is really going on is that this is part, the East-West Highway Corridor project in Maine is part of a much bigger, grander plan to use Maine um, to expedite global trade, to increase resource extraction, and to dump even more stuff in our state. And I'm gonna talk about um, each of these a little bit. Um, globalization, shipping, chipping, mining, um, more power development, uh, pipelines, railroading, and uh, landfills and waste dumps. Um, I guess I want to say here, too, that you know, I, I'm picking on these guys a little bit. Um, and uh, I, guess I, I personally believe that um, Peter Vigue and, and Daryl Brown and Doug Thomas are, are honorable people who sincerely think that the East-West Corridor could help the state. Um, but whether they're, um, in this case, captains of industry or pawns in a big Mainopoly game, uh, I, I think Maine has been targeted again. Um, as we have been for, for centuries as a resource extractive uh, region. There is, there is an organization called North America's Super Corridor Coalition. Um, and this, from their website, I got this map. There are super corridors being planned across North America and indeed around the world. Um, and Maine is as you can see, part of the scheme there. So we think of, we, I think we often tend to think about what happens inside our state. We need to be thinking more expansively because uh, a lot is going on just over the border and even across the planet that we are part of. This is a page from the uh, Chimbro website promoting the East-West Highway Corridor. As you can see, they say that we are perfectly positioned to take advantage of the big shipping opportunities. Um, I think that they actually have a pretty clear to-do list, and it includes at least the things I put on this list. Um, I didn't get this from some secret document that they have, I just pieced it together. And I've already talked about a number of these things, and the, play, the, the ones with the check marks um, have already been accomplished uh, by the development interests. Um, they already got their public-private partnership law in place, which potentially could allow the use of eminent domain for the private east-west highway corridor project. Um, they've already gotten rid of the Land Use Regulation Commission and the State Planning Office last year. Uh, Governor LePage is still holding the Land for Maine Future Bonds hostage. Uh, uh, he's also uh, been, uh, despite a promise he made during the campaign, not not uh, budgeting more money for the Maine Department of Fish and Wildlife, wildlife programs. Um, and under the LePage administration, all the efforts that the state was making to be a leader on climate, addressing climate change have come to a screeching halt. My understanding is that the promoters of the East-West Highway Corridor project don't want the federal government involved because they fear that once again, it would result in studies and public input and public hearings and um, all that messy public stuff. And so they would rather try to raise the money in the private sector and um, develop this project as a, as a private project with the exception that I mentioned that if they try to do it as a public-private partnership project, they do get some benefits under the law, including shielding the project from any freedom of information requests, and potentially and significantly, uh, and I think maybe this was why the study bill appropriation was put in, was if the state is involved in this project, even in a tiny way, that makes the state a partner. And if the state is a partner, if the, if, if the developers run into some landowners who just won't sell, and they, you can't build your highway like this and go around you know, somebody's farm. They want to go through somebody's farm and they want to be able to invoke, I think, the power of eminent domain, which only the state has for a project like this. Although the, I also could mention that the US Supreme Court a few, 
few years ago in a decision did say that um, states have the right to condemn property, private property, and transfer it to another private development interest if they can show that the project is in the public interest. I'm curious about the uh, section in Canada that goes from Coburn Gore to Sherbrooke. Is that uh, does that exist or would that have to be built? That does not exist. That, there, there, it is, there is no major road in that area. That would have to be developed. And um, I've seen in the media uh, statements by officials in Canada saying that at that point, at least several months ago, they had not even spoken to the develop the promoters of the project and that um, it might be of interest, but they have no plans at this time to uh, develop that connection. So, I mean, I think there's a reason why they won't tell us who's interested in putting up money for this project, um, which are, my guess is are not. Uh, well, when I met with Daryl Brown, the program manager for this recently, he did say, he wouldn't name names, but he did say that they are talking to about 22, I think was the number he said, of uh, potential investors, the kind of investors who can put hundreds of millions or more into a project like this. And I don't think, you know, I assume they're talking about the kind of investors that could be based anywhere in the world um, if they see this as part of the globalization I talked about. So yes, of course, this is, this, this is about moving stuff faster from Canada to Canada. Um, I also didn't say, but you reminded me that uh, we've talked for years about the two mains, dividing southern Maine and northern Maine, for instance. And, I mean, talk about the two mains. This would create physically the two mains, a divided Maine. Um, you know, I was thinking the other day about this, and, and maybe everything north of the road just would go to Canada. So I'm recognizing that, you know, you, sure, there are going to be bridges over the state highways across through Maine but that it's going to cut off travel corridors for people who are using back roads of Maine all over the state we're going to be interrupted not just wildlife but people the developer what the promoters of the project have said is that uh, of course this would be open for trucking between New Brunswick and Quebec but it would also be open they say to passenger cars who are willing to pay the toll now they won't say exactly what the toll is Mr. Vigue has said it would be probably less than a hundred dollars I, I, I'm not sure how many people in today's dollars, I'm not sure how many people are going to be willing to spend, let's say $100 or close to it, what did I say, 13,000 plus acres across the state, 220 miles. Um, you know, it has a big impact, has a shadow impact, not just on the land that they own and control within the right of way, but also has a big shadow impact on what happens outside those areas. And for instance, even if they could somehow get all the landowners along all 220 miles to be willing sellers, if they could dangle enough money in front of all of them and, and buy out all those farms and houses um, and, and woodlots, uh, there's still going to be people who live nearby who aren't in the direct path of the highway corridor, but who are going to be have their property values uh, devalued as a result of this project. And they have no recourse. Uh, I mentioned that the, the oil industry has, a, has intentions to build 10,000 miles of new oil pipelines in the next few years to get Canada's oil out to ports where they can be shipped to refineries around the world. And so it's very easy to imagine tar sands oil from Alberta coming east and going through a pipeline that would cross or come into the state like this at Coburn Gore and go to St. John, where there are New Brunswick, where there are already refineries, or go to Halifax, where there already are tankers coming in to ship oil, or go to Melford, which is the big industrial port that they want to build that I talked about in the northern part of Nova Scotia, or potentially to go to Eastport, which is the deepest water port in the United States on the East Coast, but a navigational nightmare for big ships or to go to Searsport, which already has a terminal for these kinds of facilities. And Portland, Portland, I mean, those are our three ports, Portland, Searsport, and Eastport. So what happened is that the legislature said,
to the Department of Transportation, here's $300,000, go do a study, and, and DOT put out an RFP, a request for proposals, and they got only one consultant submitting a proposal, and it was unacceptable, and they rejected it. And they were, they were going, they were about to reissue the RFP when this all got tangled up in the politics of campaigns last summer, and so the governor did officially put the study on hold, but my um, sense is that behind the scenes, a lot of stuff is still going on. And in fact, you know, I mentioned that I met with Daryl Brown last month, um, who's the project manager, program manager for this project for Chinbro, and um, he was very clear. I mean, they're going full speed ahead on this project. In fact, he said their schedule, their, their plan is to have um, all of the land ownerships essentially tied up by the end of this year and to have their permit applications in uh, to get permits. They, they do need some permits for this project. When, 